More than 6 million dead, 13 billion vaccine doses distributed, borders closed, lives changed forever. At the beginning of this year, much of the globe was finally emerging from pandemic restrictions. The world's second biggest economy held on zero COVID was essential, non-negotiable, unflinching, and then the unraveling. Outrage, protests, public anger not seen since Tiananmen Square. Chaotic scenes in major cities like Guangzhou, protesters demanding an end to restrictions. And of course, in November, anger at a boiling point, a backlash against the brutal lockdown at the world's biggest iPhone factory. Then the final straw, a deadly fire in a high-rise building in the nation's northwest region, triggering anger, protesters blaming the deaths on COVID restrictions. And now a monumental U-turn. Some say the protesters won, others that President Xi chose to save the economy. However you frame it, China is reopening. And it will shake global businesses, money markets, supply chains, and 1.4 billion people within China's borders and the world beyond. We look at what it means for all of us. Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. This is What Just Happened. I'm Akiko Fujita. And I'm Rochelle Akufo, and we're taking a deep dive into the biggest story of the week and the ripple effects felt across the world. Almost three years since the start of the pandemic, China's COVID policy has officially changed, and the nation's leaders are faced with the reality that they have missed their economic growth target for the first time by some distance. Just five years ago, Rochelle, that would have been unthinkable. And we are focusing on this topic over the next hour largely because of the implications here. Really, you know, the key question is, why are why is this happening now and why are we talking about it now? And as we highlighted, it really does in large part come down to the economic picture. We're talking about a country that is now looking at a growth rate of about 3%. Some would argue it would be sub 3%. If you want to get granular, it's imports tumbled nearly 11% from a year ago last month. We saw auto sales down 26.5% in October. These are not good signs. And when you're talking about the world's second largest economy, that's going to have ripple effects globally. And that's kind of what we're trying to focus on over the next hour. We should point out, by the way, we have already seen that pivot from the government. We saw the Politburo meeting on Wednesday making it very clear, saying that stabilizing weak economic growth is now the priority, Rochelle. I mean, we really have to wonder, what was the tipping point? A lot of people were wondering, was it the unrest? Because this isn't the first time we've seen unrest in China, but not on this scale, in multiple cities on the same issue at the same time. And as you mentioned, the economic issue as well, in terms of what was the tipping point and accelerating this reopening. We saw that the founder of Foxconn, that's the biggest iPhone assembler in the world, he wrote, according to the Washington Post, telling Chinese leaders that zero COVID would threaten China's central position in the global supply chain. And of course, you remember the chaotic scenes outside of the Apple plant, outside of that Foxconn plant, when employees had to stay in lockdown and were protesting this. And when you think beyond Apple, you've got Samsung, Volkswagen, you have a textiles company that supplies to both Nike and Adidas. And this is coming at a time when the rest of the world is trying to find its feet in terms of global demand and managing inventory. And as China being the world's largest exporter and second largest importer, eight of the top 20 ports in the world based in China, supply chains need predictability, especially at a time when central banks are trying to grapple with inflation and high prices. And as we have no idea if and when these lockdowns will arise, as these cases are coming up, this is going to be a real wake up call as we're seeing companies continue to diversify because they just don't know what's going to happen with these case counts, Akiko. Yeah, Rochelle, and while we're going to be focused on the economic picture here, uh, this is all likely to come at a cost. I'm looking at case counts on Friday. The government reported more than 16,800, roughly, new cases. Now, that is officially a decline from the kind of surge we saw last week. But remember, just on Wednesday, we saw the government lift that mandatory testing for all citizens. So there is a question about just how widespread the virus is right now, whether we can get an accurate case count because of these COVID restrictions loosening. And we did hear from Dr. Anthony Fauci over at the White House this week, raise those concerns saying that if this goes all undetected, there are concerns about new variants that could come out. And he really urged the Chinese government to import 
Western vaccines, mRNA vaccines that have been proven to be a lot more um, effective at a time when there are concerns about just how, you know, to what extent the population has immunity because those vaccine rates haven't been as high. And also they've been vaccinated with domestic vaccines that haven't been as effective. So a lot of questions to raise here, both on the economic mm. side, as well as the public health side. Indeed. Well, let's take a 20,000 foot view of this situation. We have Zong Yuan Zoe Liu, Council on Foreign Relations Fellow for International Political Economy. And of course, we have the author of The Sovereign Funds, How the Communist Party of China Finances Its Global Ambitions. Also joining us is Dane Chamorro, Control Risks Partner and Head of Global Risk Analysis and Business Intelligence Practice. Um, Zoe, I want to first start with you in terms of what you saw as the real tipping point here that led to this um, dialing back of zero COVID. Yeah, thank you very much, Rochelle, for this uh, great question. I would say there are a couple of factors uh, at play on the um, COVID and the supply chain shock perspective. To begin with, you know, the protest and COVID related things, exactly as you just pointed out, the fire in Wulumuchi, the capital of Xinjiang, really sparked the protest. But it really reflected a deeper frustration and emotion, the emotional level of social anxiety. And in particular, Chinese people's un uncertainty and to a large extent of the loss of confidence in the, econ in the economic future. And for example, you know, we've already seen discussions about uh, the possibility of a civil servant, even civil service people uh, getting a potential pay cut. So from that perspective, the as uh, you, you were earlier talking about the economic slowdown from 5.5% target and being not being able to meet it, but uh, slow down to around 3% or 3.3%, 3 3 but that number is actually being painfully felt at the individual uh, at the individual level. Dane, you know, when you think about the protests and how they played out, we have seen them quiet down since the government signaled that they are going to back off the zero COVID policy. I wonder if you think there is a risk on the government side in responding to that. They haven't necessarily said, yes, we hear you. We're going to change it because of you. But it did have an effect. And the zero COVID policy in many ways has been really the key to, to Xi Jinping, the communist government, being able to have such a tight grip over the last three years? Well, I think you know China was going to exit this policy at some point. The question was when and how. And the Chinese model for uh, pretty much all things is a very measured approach. So I don't think anybody should uh, take away from this that it's going to be an overnight black and white difference between what came, you know, a few weeks ago versus what will come now. It will be a measured, stepped uh, approach um, across the country, and it go, of course, again, China is a huge country, so you have huge disparities uh, between different parts of China. Uh, and what you'll see is them, you know, taking a couple of steps forward if they need to, but perhaps taking a step back. But fundamentally, I think what you're see going to see is that by the second half of uh, next year, after the Lunar New Year, which comes in January, and after the um, National People's Congress meets that, that happens every year in March, April, the Lianghui, as they call it in Chinese, um, you're gonna see the economy come roaring back because there's a huge amount of pent up demand, just as we saw in other parts of the world as those economies opened up after certain types of restrictions demand came roaring back. And the trick will be, for businesses particularly, will be, can you keep up with the demand? We saw that outside of China as different economies opened up. But as you alluded to, you know, the Chinese economy is so huge, this demand will come back and the, the capacity, the trick will really be keep maintaining capacity domestically to service that demand that comes roaring back in the second half of next year. And so a lot of people wondering, is there a way to quantify just how much economic damage has been done by zero COVID? And as we said, this is a slow unfolding. And you're saying even with COVID being a priority, there are four other Ds that are tied to Chinese, the Chinese economy that are also on the table. You have demand, debt decoupling and demography as well. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Rochelle, for mentioning, uh, referencing an article that I wrote uh, last month. Absolutely, you know, a lot, exactly as Dan pointed out, as China slowly uh, re uh, reopens, we will probably see a temporary or short-term rebound, just exactly as what happened here in the United States or elsewhere in the world. However, it does not necessarily solve the long-term structural problems. And on top of that, if we just think about the cost of zero COVID or the, the um, the unmaterialized GDP cost, right? So if we think, do just to do a quick, you know, back of the envelope calculation, the Chinese economy is somewhere between 17.7 7, uh, 17 .7 trillion dollars. And if we say like 2.2 .2 cost, because the tar economic target was 5.5%, and now let's say optimistically it's 3%. 3 so we are talking about some somewhere between 2% 2, 2 or 2.2% a loss in GDP, and that is somewhere between, you know, $380 billion. So that's not a insignificant amount of money. And on top of that, we're also talking about a lot of major global companies thinking about pulling out of China or even have accelerated their pulling out of China. So from the long-term perspective, both international, uh, international factors and domestic factors probably is going to make the Chinese economy in the long run, not necessarily going to materialize uh, the so-called 8% growth, uh, growth potential as some Chinese economists might have opt optimistically uh, estimated. Zong Yuan, Zoe Liu, uh, appreciate you joining us along with uh, Dane tomorrow um, from Control Risk. Thanks so much for that. We'll travel to Shanghai today and you'll have over a thousand Starbucks stores to choose from. And you can even find a Dunkin' or Blue Bottle if that's your thing. China is big business for U.S. corporations of all stripes, but many of these slashed investments this year. Are we on the road to recovery? Yahoo Finances and s for a has the details. And Akiko, it's important to note that when we're talking about U.S. companies and China, there are two aspects to this. The first is the Chinese consumer and the sales and services that these U.S. companies provide to the China market. And we have seen U.S. companies talking about their declining sales because of the COVID lockdowns in China. For example, you had Starbucks that talked about its revenue miss because of uh, same-store sales down in China. You also have Estee Lauder, which has uh, lowered its profit guidance. And then you've got companies like Nike also talking about its revenue down in China. Now, on the other side of this, you have the manufacturing side of this, because many U.S. companies uh, made big bets on China as being their main manufacturing hub. And so we saw during the pandemic, the supply chain issues, you had companies that were kind of rethinking their strategy. And now with the COVID lockdowns, those recent lockdowns have also accelerated those plans. And I will leave you with this, and this is the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai latest survey of U.S. companies. 19% of respondents said that they were going to plan cutting their investments in China in 2022. That's up from 10% last year. And mainly one of the top reasons or the top reason was the zero COVID lockdown uh, that had been happening in China. Akiko. In fact, Praz, let's go to you now. Hey, Inez, thanks for uh, that little report there. Up next, it's been over a decade since China became the world's biggest auto market. We'll take a look at the impact the lockdowns had one major U.S. corporation amid fresh reports of production cuts. More on that after the break.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. This is what just happened. I'm Pras Subramanian. Let's talk about China's auto sector. From Detroit's big three to Volkswagen, building market share in the nation has been a critical goal for decades. COVID put a wrench in that plan, to say the least. VW Group, one of, the, one, one of the many taking a hit from COVID-related stoppages, though a major plant in Chengdu just reopened a few days ago. Tesla, meanwhile, suffering from an ongoing demand issues, leading it to cut prices and reportedly slashing output at Shanghai Gigafactory. For more on that, let's bring in Dan Ives, senior analyst at WebBush, who joins me now in studio. Dan, thanks for joining us. Let's talk, let's talk about overall big picture in China. What's your take on what's happening there with all the COVID-related stuff with regards to automakers? Look, it's been a nightmare. I mean, I think you're starting to see cracks in the armor for the first time in many years. And obviously, competition is increasing in the EV landscape. You've seen that. I almost call it a Game of Thrones going on between Tesla and Neo, Xping, and others. And I think that's, look, that's the hearts and lungs of the overall EV bull story. So I think that's, you've seen a lot of pressure on these automakers. And it's a storm they need to navigate. You know, you mentioned Tesla. You know, we've seen reports of production cuts. They've had to cut prices as well and actually adding some sort of insurance incentives. Are you kind of worried about Q4 for Tesla? Look, I think after the Cinderella ride for the last three to four years, I mean, they're, they're hitting some hurdles. And I think you've seen that. And even though a lot of it was, we'll call it production or supply chain driven, you're starting to see some demand cracks. Now, look, I don't believe the longer term story in China is thrown out the window. I, I just think they're navigating now some really, for the first time in years, some growth challenges. They're cutting price. You've seen some, I'd say, supply chain reductions. And now we got to see, not just in Q4, but 2023, 2 million units. That's the line in the sand globally. So you think that with these sort of production, uh, uh, the COVID restrictions going away, that Tesla might actually have some, some kind of runway here? Look, I feel like that's going to, similar as Apple, right? I think that's going to give them a little more flexibility because right now you got consumers locked in their apartments or houses. They're not focused on iPhones and Teslas, right? Or Lululemon pants. And I think that's part of the problem is that now what's a normalized environment look like in China? Recessions clearly hit, but now I think the streets starting to look past this and what does 2023 look like? I think that's really the focus right now, not just for Tesla, for Neo, Xping, BYD and others. So GM also, a lot of operations in China, a bunch of joint ventures there. Um, they've also uh, come out with their newest like EV game plan, the updated game plan, where they're seeing profits kind of push forward a bit uh, from, those, from those types of vehicles. Is GM kind of better positioned in China than Tesla? Look, I mean, and I, was, I was there in Detroit this week, spending time at the headquarters. I think right now the most underestimated story across automotive is GM. I think the transformation that Mary and the team are building on EV is a lot of skepticism. I believe we're going to sit here two, three years from now and view this as a really pivotal sort of chapter for the company because it's Altium, because they ultimately own that food chain. You start to do some math. I believe this could be a stock that gets significantly re-rated. And even if China for them is insignificant, in terms of with the conversion opportunity for GM, there's a renaissance in the 313 area code between GM as well as Ford. Yeah, that Dearborn rivalry, a cross-town rivalry. Um, back to China again, we're talking about the world's biggest car market, the biggest EV market by far and away. We talked about GM and Tesla sort of battling it out. Maybe they're, one of those guys will be on top. But could it be BYD? I mean, they're really knocking out of the park with EV and hybrid sales. Are they sort of the sleeping giant there? I think they are. I think that's one, you know, everyone knows them, but I think under the covers, that's sort of probably one of the biggest opportunities for them in terms of in the China market. Now look, the golden child continues to be Neo, you know, in terms of what they're obviously doing. But look, it's not a zero sum game. And I think that's the one that's important. You're gonna see a lot of vendors continue to benefit. You still have conversion in terms of overall EVs that's in the low teens, a lot of opportunity ahead. It's a lot of opportunity there for multiple uh, competitors there too. Dan Ives, Webbush, thank you so much for joining Thanks us. Thanks for being here. Rochelle, over to you. All right, great stuff, Pras. Well, another company dealing with its share of complications from China's COVID measures is, of course, Apple. Now, the issues stem not just from a manufacturing perspective, but demand. China makes up nearly a quarter of the group's global sales. Yahoo Finance's Ali Garfinkel has that story for us. Hey, Ali. Hi, Rochelle. So it was in late November that violent protests first erupted at that key Foxconn factory in China. This was major for two big reasons. The first is that this factory was and is producing iPhones on a massive scale. And like we've talked about, it was a rare scene of public violent dissent in China. The protests, of course, came after weeks of strict COVID lockdown procedures and years of China's zero COVID policy. 
it all really came to a head, honestly, with Apple and now China's manufacturing relationship with the company is now inextricably connected to the government's decision to pull back on its COVID policies. You know, we saw that Foxconn letter come in from, you know, Terry Guo saying this is going to affect the global supply chain. Um, however, the damage maybe has already been done, right? There are some numbers out there that are pretty jarring. Apple is down about 6 million iPhones as a result of these protests. And, you know, we're starting to see that the company has reaffirmed its plans to diversify its manufacturing away from China to India. This was something that has, you know, has been talked about for some time, but there's definitely a sense that it's been sped up here. By 2025, Apple could make 25% of all its iPhones in China. I don't know if it would have accelerated the way it has, certainly, Rochelle, if we hadn't seen these protests. The bottom line here from my end is that this period in China's, that China is now coming out of maybe has had permanent or at least lasting effect on the company's manufacturing relationship with Apple. Bottom line, China's strict COVID policy, I think it caused the human link in Apple's supply chain maybe not to break, but certainly to bend. Tossing to you, Jared, in the studio. All right, coming up on the show, global supply chains don't function when the world's growth engine stalls, but with U.S. ports already feeling the pressure, what happens when container volume from Shanghai ramps up? We're going to tell you all about it up next. Welcome back. This is What Just Happened. I'm Jared Blickery. Turning now to the impact on the supply chain. Prior to the pandemic, Chinese GDP that stood at 5.5% and was viewed as a floor. Then the unthinkable negative growth in 2020, which we see right here, it was reversed like a, sh a slingshot, excuse me. After settling down a bit, the latest economic print came in at 3.9%, and economic prosperity was essentially sacrificed for political control. So, probably not a coincidence that the dramatic policy change was enacted just as Chinese trade data was falling off a cliff, with both November imports 
imports and exports slowing by the greatest amount in years. Now, drilling down into some familiar U.S. company names reveals the extent to which the Chinese and U.S. economies have become intertwined. Now, take Apple. Many companies derive the majority, in some cases substantially, all of their rev revenue from this one behemoth. Takes Foxconn over there on the left. That uh, gets about 57% of its sales from Apple. Also note that the giant chip company, Taiwan Semiconductor, gets over one quarter of its sales from Apple. Now, that is a huge slice of a huge pie. And it's a very similar story for Nike. Feng Tei Enterprises derives 87% of its sales from the shoe and apparel giant, while Shenzhou International, 25%, Yuan Industrial, 22%. So in the grand scheme of things, China lockdowns were affecting some U.S. companies across the entire demand supply curve. Now, one bright spot, at least, when it comes to shipping, is container rates, which had already surged fivefold in 2021. They had already come back down to earth. The cost to ship from Shanghai to Los Angeles, New York, or Rotterdam, now about 80% off of those highs, which we see here. And you can see this goes back about 10 years. Finally, we are in a range that we have seen that's manageable over the last 10 years. Now, some say that the stock market is forward looking and Chinese stocks started rallying about four to six weeks ago. And these are the results over the trailing month. And you can see a lot of these stocks on the top line, some of them up more than 100 percent. Billy Billy up 155 percent, Dada up 125 percent. So a lot of work to be done, but some of that already uh, reflected in the share prices. Over to you, Akiko. Yeah, Jared, you have to wonder how much of that rally that we're seeing has to do with how fall, how far these stocks have fallen. But uh, thanks so much for that, Jared. Well, chipmakers were certainly one group affected by the ongoing supply chain backlog, but that wasn't the only issue for the sector. TSMC has long been a barometer for the health of the sector. U.S. investors expressed uneasiness about Taiwan semiconductors earlier this year because of national security concerns around chips and Taiwan some of those potentially resolved by the company's investment in a U.S. plant in Arizona. Now, though that investment is now drawing concerns in Taiwan, where chip manufacturing is the backbone of the economy. Let's bring in Needham Co. Semiconductor Analyst Charles Xi. And Charles, I want to see if we can kind of separate these two issues. There's the issue of national security and then the issue of the backlog that happened because those borders were shut down during the pandemic. How much of one is driving the other? Well, uh, I want to make sure I understand the second part of the question. Uh, but first, let me address the first part on national security. I, I think uh, from a business perspective, it's national security uh, issue actually mean, for the companies means the business continuity issue. I think one thing uh, that uh, over the last three, four, five years, as Taiwan semi rises to where they are, the global giant, that's what the President Biden said, um, they become a near monopoly at the most advanced semiconductor manufacturing. What that means is companies like Apple, which account for Taiwan semi's a quarter of a sales, they don't quite have, have alternative to Taiwan semi. So to those companies, what that business continuity means is they would like to like Taiwan Semi to have a little bit geographically diversified manufacturing footprint. Um, they Taiwan Semi hasn't hadn't been like a really have much presence outside of Taiwan. And their initial plan in Arizona has been seen as probably that's a token fab. That's what I heard. But I think at, at two, three days ago, the big announcement in Arizona that definitely shows them that, that their commitment uh, uh, to provide their customers the business continuity by solving the business continuity issue for the companies, for the customers, I think indirectly that addresses the national security concern by the United States. And quite frankly, many, many companies, uh, many, many, many countries in the world that depends on Taiwan Semi to provide them the most leading edge semiconductor manufacturing. Yeah, we have seen this administration firmly focused on onshoring production. And my question to you is how much of that stems from what happened during COVID, the, re the realization of the over-reliance on Chinese production? But separately from that, how does China now respond to this policy at a time when they may not have the most advanced equipment coming in from some of the Western countries? Well, 
I think semiconductor industry is a globalized industry. Uh, let's let's not forget that it was born in 1960s, 70s. It grew uh, as the globalization of the uh, develops uh, and actually lifted China out of poverty. Right, uh, in a, starting from the 1980s, I think even for China. Uh, the access to uh, global semiconductor uh, technology is important. And um, I don't think it necessarily should mean that China should have everything on its soil. Just like the US, the US doesn't have ev everything in, on, on the US soil. I think uh, it's unfortunate that, that there are signs of deglobalization in the recent years. But I think a semiconductor industry, this is an industry where if you have the technology, you have the customers, you have the demand. If you don't have the technology, you just don't have that. Well, you just can't do anything about that. So in terms of how China going to respond, I, I don't I can't really provide a clear answer. But I think from China's perspective, they would rather keep the access to Taiwan Semi. I mean, at least the Taiwan Semi, uh, they at least that's what they would prefer to do. But uh, I think for business continuity standpoint, they still should have, uh, uh, they still sh they should think about providing the alternative uh, geographical manufacturing footprint to their customers, not just in Taiwan, maybe in the US. And Charles, you added TSMC to the Needham conviction list, but you do expect um, the wafer shipments to start declining in the first quarter of 2023. Walk us through your theory there. Um, well, semiconductor industry is um, is actually it's cyclical, but it's actually surprisingly consistent in terms of uh, the, the trend line. The trend line is there, the 20, 30 year trend line. Um, uh, it's a growing secular growth industry, but uh, when uh, the, the shipment intermeasured by unit uh, goes above the trend for a period of time, which is something we have seen starting in 2020, 2021 uh, lasted into at least the first half, uh, maybe uh, the, the third quarter 2022, you will go under the trend for a while to bring the overall trend to the to long term trend line. So what we think is going to happen is there will likely be a reset of Taiwan semi unit shipment or the wafer shipment starting in Q1 2023. But the reset is actually good news for the stock. Uh, uh, so we'll likely see next year is that numbers may come down. Uh, they may miss estimates, but the stocks will act, may actually do very well next year. That's my projection here. All right, we'll certainly be keeping an eye on that. A big thank you to Needman Company Semiconductor Analyst Charles Shi. Thank you so much. Thank All right, you. now let's get to our very own Rick Newman, who will tell us what's coming up next on this week's What Just Happened. Hey, Rick. Hey, thanks, Rochelle. Coming up next, we've seen the first annual decline in China's energy demand in 20 years. But if China's energy uh, economy comes roaring back next year, does that impact your price at the pump? I'll give you the crude reality next. <laughs> 
to What Just Happened. I'm Rick Newman, and we're taking a deep dive into the China effect. Let's talk about oil and energy demand and why America might be the winner here. Now, China's COVID shutdowns have meant reduced demand for energy, which has lowered prices, including the prices we pay here in the United States. And if China rebounds next year, that could mean higher prices here. Let's start with where we are right now in energy markets. We've got uh, gasoline prices here in the United States at about $3.30 a gallon, obviously way down from $5 a gallon that we saw in June, and oil prices here in the United States around $72 a gallon. That's down from a high of around $120 per gallon over the, uh, per barrel over the summer. Uh, and that's good news for Americans, obviously. President Biden and the Biden White House, they keep sending out press releases, making sure everybody knows that gas prices are now actually lower than they were a year ago. Biden is taking credit for this. Uh, he has released oil from the St Strategic Reserve, and they just put in place this complicated price cap on Russian oil. But that is not the main reason uh, energy prices are down here in the United States. The biggest reason energy prices are down is reduced demand from China. Uh, this is a sleeper factor in the energy industry. Not too, people are, not too many people are noticing this, but if you don't take my word for it, let me tell you what S&P Global Commodities said in a briefing uh, I participated in earlier this week. They said, China's COVID policy, meaning the lockdowns, is the most important fundamental factor for energy markets. Were it not for this demand weakness, prices of all commodities would have undoubtedly been higher in 2022. And if China's energy demand and imports are strong in 2023, commodity prices will be well supported. Now, well supported commodity prices means higher commodity prices. And we're talking about not just oil and gasoline, but also natural gas. Uh, and those are things that uh, we are affected by. So uh, S&P actually does forecast uh, a significant increase in demand uh, from China for those forms of energy this year. And that probably is going to mean higher gas prices here in the United States. Now, uh, how high are we talking about? If you go back, if you look at an oil price chart and you go back to 2011, look at the 2011 to 2014 timeframe, uh, global oil prices hit a uh, hundred bucks, 110 bucks. And a lot of that was because the Chinese economy was booming and they were just buying tons of energy. When the Chinese economy really gets going, it totally uh, supercharges prices for commodities. So uh, we, may, we may be at a bottom here for energy prices. If, it, if people could stockpile gasoline, I'd say go do it. You can't really do that. Uh, but if China does come back, as many economists uh, think, that is going to be, mean higher uh, gasoline prices here, higher electricity prices, and higher heating prices. So in a way, uh, it would be good for Americans if the Chinese uh, lockdowns continued. Back to you, Rochelle. Indeed. All right. Well, a big thank you to Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman. They will be keeping an eye on those gas prices. We're also keeping an eye on crude oil, just one part of the commodity market that will be impacted by China's reopening. Let's not forget, expansionary economic policies in Beijing have been the main driver of everything from silver to copper and iron ore for over two decades now. The latter hitting its highest level in four months today on expectations of a revival of the crucial property sector. Well, for a broad look at the commodity space now, we're joined by Path Trading Partners co-founder and chief market strategist Bobby Acino. Thank you for joining us today, Bob. So first, I want to start with the oil picture. We're seeing that oil is down for the week. A lot of that perhaps tied to the reopening. Some of it jitters, wondering with the Fed as well. But what are you watching in terms of the oil picture and what we can expect in terms of demand with China? Well, good morning and thanks for having me again. Oil to me has, has a characteristic to it. It almost has a personality in terms of price action. And that personality is basically it trades in a wide sideways band of price until there's some sort of disruption to either supply or demand. Recently, we've had disruption to demand expectations based on slowing economies. The China story has been priced in multiple times in crude oil and it hasn't really stuck. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to change things uh, now that there is a version of reopening. But, you know, there's a devil in the details to the reopening. China hasn't been buying as much crude as they had, but they were still buying quite a bit of it from Russia. There's evidence right now from some of the people we speak to that they're buying despite the price cap and Russia is self-insuring to get around those rules. So they have a source of energy that isn't necessarily going to be crude oil that is taken off the global market because it's Russian crude oil.
which theoretically is already off the global market. So while I agree that if they come back like they did in 2011, we're going to see higher energy prices, there's a caveat to that. When you reopen and you don't have widespread vaccinations or very good health care that is COVID based, you could lock down sectors again. You could see people voluntarily not traveling at the rate that they maybe would have. That's probably down the road. We saw them in the protests that the Chinese populace really wants to get out of these lockdowns. But once those numbers start crawling up and the death rates start crawling up again, they may change their minds and you could see a little bit of a slowdown. That's crude oil specific. So, Bob, I mean, if we bring it back to those comments that Rick got from S&P Global saying that China's COVID policy is the most important fundamental factor, I mean, it sounds like you're saying that's not exactly the case because the virus case counts could really sort of dampen that this push for additional demand coming out of one of the largest markets. Well, Akiko, I'm not saying it's not the case. I'm just saying there's two sides to that story. It isn't a guarantee that simply because China is reopening, they're going to go gangbusters buying energy like they were in 2011. And to be fair, I don't think that's what Rick was saying either. I just think he was bringing up the upside case since we've been so far to the downside. And I do think we've put in a short to medium term bottom in crude oil here. Uh, a while back, um, I was on, I believe it was your show, where I said 65 before 100 and five. Um, I still believe that. That's a little easier to say now that we're in the low 70s. But then I really don't see us getting to 100, at least till the U.S. summer driving season arrives again, simply because, number one, you have to worry about the health of the global economy. And whether you believe there's going to be a recession or not, there's a slowdown in place. You see it everywhere except for the non-farm payrolls data. Everywhere else, there's a slowdown, at least in the U.S. economy. And also, we're likely to see the ECB and the Bank of England be aggressive next week in the face of double-digit inflation. So you're likely to see slowdowns continue there. But from that perspective, China can make up for their own consumption and get prices up maybe $15 to $20 from where they are now. And how reliant should they be on, on sort of what they're seeing in terms of domestic demand, especially when you think of things like metals as well? Well, copper, obviously a key one. China has been for a long, quite a long time, the biggest consumer and smelter of copper. We've seen copper go up in the last 12 sessions, almost 9% since the September, uh, the end of September, since those lows, when the talk of the COVID zero policy being pulled back by China started, copper's up 18 and a quarter percent. So there's been quite a move, but we're still only back to February 2021 levels. And I think this reflects, Rochelle, the balance between global slowdown and China reopening. China will absolutely spend. They will build. So that's why I think crude oil and industrial metals are almost two separate stories on the backs of the China reopening. If China is reopening aggressively and putting that stimulus into play without sort of policy lockdowns, People can decide on their own, sick or not, to use less fuel, especially as we get into warmer temperatures in the spring, but the government can still build and they're likely still to drive copper higher. Plus, longer term, I believe copper is a play long anyway. And why I say that is because I don't think electrification is slowing down and the amount of copper and other industrial metals involved in the electrification of the globe, the decarbonization of the globe, those numbers are large. Bob Iacchino, always good to get your insight. Path Trading Partners co-founder and chief market strategist. Now let's go to Anjali Kamlani, who's going to tell us what's next on this week. What just happened, Anjali? So, Fred Akiko, coming up, the economic impact of China's policy change is huge. But what about the risk from COVID itself? Quarantines, mass testing, and lockdowns won't do the job they once did. Could the impact really be 2 million deaths? We'll discuss next.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. This is What Just Happened, and I'm Anjali Kimlani. So far, we've heard the various ways China's COVID struggles have trickled down into the economy and business. But it's time to focus on one thing itself, the one thing itself that started it all, COVID. China took its first major steps this week to loosening a strict zero COVID policy, and for the first time, the nation all but ending the threat of mass lockdowns. Here's a recap of what happened and what China is facing in the months ahead. The timeline, the, the apartment fire on November 24th, that's what resulted in 10 deaths and was the final straw in a series of events that began in October. First, Foxconn locks down and keeps a closed loop on its workers. But that strategy backfires as migrant workers start to flee. The city of Zhengzhou then locks down, followed by Shanghai. Around this time, China is starting to take small steps to ease restrictions, such as reducing quarantining for inbound travelers, as well as reducing the number of close contacts. But then, protests erupt at the Foxconn plant, Apple's biggest iPhone manufacturer. Once again, the Chinese find themselves struggling to access basic necessities and facing limitations on where they can go and constantly taking PCR tests. But then that deadly fire on November 14th really sparks. The nations in, North, in, the, North, in the nation's Northwest area and protests erupt across the country. That's when President Xi then has to take some steps to ease the policy. It's the first time the Chinese can start to move freely except for areas of high circulation and will now be limited to just buildings and floors rather than entire cities or neighborhoods. But the big problem with all this is it's the winter season. We know that COVID and other respiratory viruses thrive and some projections estimate millions of cases and China potentially reaching 2 million deaths. Because of its lockdown policies, China has successfully curbed these kinds of outbreaks and these numbers that we saw around the globe but it means that the population is more vulnerable. There's less vaccination rates, especially in the elderly. They have not, they're more susceptible to severe COVID and death as a result of not having exposure to the virus. And the efficacy of the country's homegrown vaccines are also in question, even as the country is working to uh, put its own mRNA contender on the market and has been reportedly weighing imports only for the non-Chinese population of Pfizer's vaccine. And so putting it all together, it paints a very concerning picture as the virus will continue to strain the economy. Over to Yokigo. Yeah, Anjali, really quickly here, because I know you followed this very closely on the vaccines themselves. I mean, what are the prospects for an mRNA vaccine that's developed domestically? I mean, we have heard the criticism before that the domestic vaccines simply aren't effective enough. They aren't effective enough. I would actually compare it to maybe even the AstraZeneca vaccine, right? Uh, it's a similar process where some populations may benefit more than others based on the efficacy, based on the technology. The mRNA contender, they're looking to get on the market by, I believe, March was the earliest I saw. So in the early part of 2023, whether or not it can stand up and hold up to Pfizer and Moderna and sort of the baseline that they've set is really what will remain to be seen. They already have a nasal vaccine on the market, which is something we don't have here. And the U.S. market is trying to catch up with with the rest of the world. So it really is a mixed bag in terms of the picture of that efficacy. And and we don't have any results yet to to figure out. Yeah, it's certainly going to be critical over the next few months. And I know you're going to be watching that. Anjali Kamlani, thanks so much for that. Well, coming up, the long game in the years just preceding COVID, China contributed 30 percent to global GDP growth while positioning itself as the next great economy. Is the grand strategy still on course? We'll look ahead next.
we've spent the last hour analyzing the complexity surrounding China's reopening. So Akiko, obviously our guests went through a lot, a lot of topics covered. What are your main takeaways? I mean, there's certainly a lot of takeaways when you look at the threads that we have to follow, following the extraordinary events that have played out over the last few weeks. Of course, we started with the fires over in Urumqi triggering the protests that happened. And then we're talking about the economic picture as we continue to see China reopen. But one factor we haven't addressed as much is what these protests mean, especially for younger workers as well as migrant workers. When you think about how this all started, yes, it was about the fires that happened in Urumqi and concerns that those residents were locked in because of COVID. And that, that was the reason why they couldn't escape. But at the same time, this points to brewing dissatisfaction um, that has been happening in China. When you look at youth unemployment, more than 20 percent right now, and then you look at migrant workers who have had to stay back when their factories have been shut down, they haven't necessarily been paid during that time as well. Now you've got the Chinese government not necessarily apologizing, but at least acknowledging what happened and then responding to that. You have to wonder if that's going to add to more protests to come. I w should point out, Rochelle, just one point here when you think about how widespread all of this was. We're talking about more than 40 protests across more than 20 Chinese cities, and that simply is something we haven't seen in decades. It's true. I mean, and when you figure that we're about three years into this pandemic and we've seen the rest of the world opening up and then you look at China still having these zero COVID policies, you could sense this growing frustration. People can't plan for their lives. How do you work? How do you plan to buy a home if you're not sure when you're going to be in lockdown? And what, touching on something else that one of our guests was talking about, that COVID perhaps exacerbated some things, but there are underlying economic issues that, as you said, maybe that could also produce unrest. We saw from Zhongwan Zoe Liu, she talked about four Ds that could be holding back China's economy. Those are demand, debt, decoupling and demography. I mean, when you talk about demand, we're seeing global demand starting to slow down. When you talk about demography, you have an aging population in China. Debt. China took on a lot of debt over the course of COVID, trying to prop up the economy. And of course, this decoupling, this sort of shifting of some of these some of these international relations as we see this pivot, perhaps away from the US in terms of competition, turning to other others in the region like India, turning to Saudi Arabia. So a lot certainly at play here. But a lot of moving parts, and we'll have to see just how this reopening actually ends up trickling and how fast it ends up rolling out. You know, question about that. Uh, that does it for this week's That's uh, What Just Happened, I should say. I'm Akiko Fujita, along with Rochelle Akufo. Thanks so much for watching.